When you think of graphic design, do you think of advertisements, graphics on websites, spreads in magazines? While these examples certainly fit under the graphic design definition, the term encompasses a lot. Ads, thumbnails, posters, logos, infographics, video games, vector graphics, raster graphics, mobile apps, product labels, signs, website layouts, software interfaces, etc. etc. If we dig a little deeper, it's truly an art, an expression of one's aesthetic conveying ideas through visuals and design. It's a craft where professionals create visual content to communicate messages. Designers use different elements and principles of design to meet user specific needs and focus on the logic of displaying elements to optimize the user experience. But believe it or not, graphic design isn't a black and white concept. To fully grasp the concept of graphic design, it's important to have a solid understanding. So in this video on introduction to graphic design, we shall briefly try and understand the elements and principles that make up graphic design. Before we get started, I want to introduce you to Great Learning Academy, a free initiative by Great Learning where you can access over 200 plus courses with 1000 hours of free content on trending high demand domains such as data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, programming, cloud computing, digital marketing, DevOps, management and many more. Absolutely free. These courses are designed by award winning academicians and leading industry experts. You can also get a free certificate of completion when you enroll and complete these free courses. You also get access to the presentations, code notebooks, data sets and quiz. We have courses in English and in Hindi as well to give you the best learning experience in the language you are comfortable with. Check out the description of this video to access the relevant course on Great Learning Academy. So what are you waiting for? Register now and start your learning journey today. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, I want to request you to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notifications bell so that you don't miss out on any new updates or video releases from Great Learning. If you enjoy this video, show us some love and like this video. Knowledge increases by sharing, so make sure you are sharing this video with your friends and colleagues as well. Make sure to comment on the video any queries or suggestions and I will respond to your comments. Hi, my name is Saurabh Mukherjee and welcome to the course on Introduction to Graphic Design. Well, to start with, what is graphic design? In this course, we will explain to you briefly what graphic design is, what are its users, what are its principles, and how it came about. According to a popular encyclopedia, graphic design is a process of visual communication and problem solving through the use of typography, photography, iconography, and illustration. You would think, what, what is the problem that we face today that graphic design can solve? So to start with, it could be anything. For example, it could be how to make your brand more popular on Instagram, how to gain more brand visibility outside using signboards, illustrations, or even how to market your product in order to create your identity on various social networking platforms. So the field is generally considered a subset of visual communication and communication design, but sometimes the term graphic design is only used. So what is visual communication? Visual communication is when we convey ideas and information in the forms that can be seen through images, designs, art, infographics, graphs, any kind of visual representation of something that we want to convey or a message that we want to convey is visual communication. Visual communication is a part in a part or wholly relies on our eyesight. Visual communication is a broad, broad spectrum that includes signs, typography, drawing, graphic design, illustration, industrial design, advertising, animation, color, and many electronic resources. And it's evaluated based on measuring how the audience comprehends the visual communication design. It is not based on personal aesthetics or artistic preferences as there is no universally agreed upon principle of aesthetics or artistic preferences for that matter. One of the most common examples in an everyday practice of visual communication that is used by everyone is the use of emojis. That is a perfect example of what exactly visual communication is. We don't use words in order to communicate, rather we use these small icons and symbols to communicate what we have to say. But visual communication then again can digress into many things such as presentations, graphs, infographics and even video for that matter. And for the sake of keeping this video short, we will just stick to graphic design. So now that we've got a brief idea of what graphic design is, 
Now let's understand what graphic designers do. So graphic designers create and combine symbols, images, and text to form visual representations of ideas and messages. But it's sort of like applied art, but not completely. Graphic designers are present in, you know, all kinds of fields, be it technology, entertainment, news, even newspapers, your books, everywhere graphic design is present and graphic designers are required. This brings us to our next subject, careers and applications of graphic design. To start with, there are numerous careers across all kinds of services and product based companies as brands and products in today's digital world need adequate image based representation. Hence required designers of all shapes and sizes. One of the companies that takes graphic design to a new level is obviously Apple. But all other companies require designers from their advertising to everyday social posting, visiting cards to websites, brand logos to marketing campaigns, designers everywhere. So where does it all start? This being a short video, we will not dwell deep into the history of design and many other aspects. But I shall explain a few basic concepts and tools of graphic design. To create a design of value, one has to have all fundamentals in place. The fundamentals of graphic design are about seeing and understanding how the quality of visual material, shapes, images, color theory, typography and layout work and work together. And then being able to decide which qualities of each are relevant and engaging and useful for visualizing a particular idea or solving a certain problem. The principle of graphic design are like the foundation, each layer on top of the other until you're left with the foundation for creating something incredible. Whether you're designing a logo, a website or a custom illustration, your fundamentals have to be in place. Now let's move on. What are the actual fundamentals of design? What are the fundamentals of design? You have layout elements, typography and color that we are going to focus on today. Otherwise, there are many more fundamentals also, but we will focus on these basic four. So layout consists of space, balance, alignment and hierarchy elements. These are graphic elements that sole purpose is just to add aesthetic value to your design. Also, sometimes to play with the movement of the eye and to ascertain importance to certain aspects of your design. We will see how that works later on. Then you have logos, which are basically the face of your brand. Illustrations basically give your eye a place, a resting place, something to look at after you've consumed the information in your design and graphics. Graphics are of many types. They can be integrated into your information or they can be a way to represent your information. There are many, many such examples. Typography. Typography is used in your basic text. It could be your titles or your main content. And a part of typography is how to use different types of fonts, when and why. Color. Color is how you influence. It's the power in your design. It is how you drive engagement, but you need to know how to use it. Now that we've broadly looked into the fundamentals, now let's go into them a bit. So we can start with layout and spacing. So what is space? You know, the best designs don't come out when you try to fit all your elements into one single composition. You need to op utilize open space to bring attention to certain elements in a gradual manner. That is what space is. To balance the negative space and the positive space. To balance the empty areas in your design with the full areas. So that there is an overall wholesome to your, wholesomeness to your design. It does not feel completely empty. Neither is it completely full. You need to refrain from clutter in the corner and uh, too much information in the same frame. If you overload the frame, that is also not completely utilizing space. And if you have very little in your frame, that is also not completely correct. So that is one thing. The other thing is the way you space your elements within the frame. Generally, your frame is a 2D space, either a graphic editing software on your computer or a sheet of paper. And within that space, you have to see your Elements are adequately spaced from either sides, from the top or the bottom. They should be center aligned. They should have adequate spacing on all sides. They should be completely readable and spacing does that a lot. If you were to put it completely to one edge, 
it would have an entirely different effect. You should leave enough headroom, enough legroom and such and so forth. Another key aspect of space is the grid. Most designers see an invisible grid running through all their designs. In modern web design, clean grid lines have become popular amongst all and they are almost impossible to avoid. There are few simple reasons for this. Grids make your designs cleaner, more efficient and easier to adapt. Now let's talk about balance. When it comes to design, you can definitely be creative, but you also have to be balanced. Think of it like this. If you were to decorate your living room, you wouldn't try to squeeze the sofa, the recliner, the coffee table and the end tables all into a tiny corner. Nor would you spread the pieces throughout the room to create balance and alignment. With design, it's exactly the same. Designers must constantly juggle different elements to find harmony in their design. Imagine an invisible set of scales in each design and make sure you don't tip the scales by clustering your elements on one side of your grid. Keep in mind that in terms of composition, white space, which is negative space, is also an element. White space gives our eyes paths to follow through the design. Give each element on the page some space to breathe and balance between positive and negative space will emerge organically. You can see how moving the elements in a web design closer together, thus shrinking the negative space, disrupting the balance, makes the design very claustrophobic and ultimately unsuccessful. So that is what balance is. It is the balance between the two types of spaces, negative and positive. Positive being where your elements lie and the negative space are the spaces between them. Supposing in this image, if the H and the I and the E and the R were all squeezed together, you wouldn't be able to even read what the word says. That is one thing. Now let's talk about hierarchy. Hierarchy is similar to emphasis and scale, but the eye generally needs a place to rest or soothing of interest to hold it. Otherwise, people will look at your design and quickly move on. Say you take a photograph of your mom at a reunion. Your purpose is to bring attention to that moment and the joy of gathering by making your mom the subject and focal point of your composition. So hierarchy does that. Hierarchy is how you present the elements on your design. This directs viewers to where they should focus their attention. As a general rule of thumb, the larger the design element, the more attention grabbing it will. But there's a lot more to visual hierarchy than bigger is better. This one is simple enough though. People read bigger things first. If your eyes go to hierarchy before size does matter, in this picture, then you can probably say that hierarchy is working. So then let me explain to you hierarchy. So hierarchy can also be done in other ways to emphasize importance on certain elements in your design. It ne not necessarily does it have to be size, but size does matter. However, what brings about this smaller line at the bottom also, that is the movement of your eye and the asserting of importance within your design as well. So more important elements are to be given hierarchy by size, by bright colors. It could even be by other elements in your frame that point towards it. And that is what our next, next subject is about. So let's move on to elements. What are graphic elements? Graphic elements can be lines, shapes, logos, illustrations, patterns. They can even be your background. They could be color. They could be almost anything, photographs, everything becomes a graphic element. So let's talk about lines and shapes initially. Lines and shapes form the foundation of your design and how to use them can completely transform how your design looks. So initially, as you can see within this presentation also, I have lines underneath each element as well to emphasize importance and the shapes can be these bullet points. Their usage is very similar to how we use underlining and bullet points in even our everyday text. Underlines add emphasis, bullet points as well add emphasis and also separate them from the other paragraph text. So graphic elements such as lines are used to draw at one's attention. You can say that they're also used as enders and breakers when you want a certain element to have a boundary or to end at a certain point, you will use a line. You can say that these lines are sort of the end of the frame. You can say that these lines are also the end of the frame. You can use lines to start something or to signify the end of an element as well. What are shapes? As you can see, these triangles will be shapes. You can use different shapes to convey different meaning. Shapes can be used in pyramids, squares, pie charts, 
circles and they can be added into your elements depending on how and why you wish to use them. Logos. So logos are the face of your brand and the shapes you incorporate into your logo will determine your audience and how it perceives you. There are different meanings behind logos and shapes and how to make sure you put your best face forward. However, a company's logo is also a way for someone to recognize something instantly. Suppose your graphic is about, you're trying to make a graphic about famous brands. So when you put their brand logos, there is already so much exposure to logos that someone will already understand exactly what you mean by just a simple design. Rounded logos, angular logos and logos with vertical lines all create a completely different brand and design experience. For example, a design that's all rounded edges will send a very different message than a design that embraces sharp lines. Understanding the meaning of lines and shapes is crucial for creating designs that are in line with your brand, vision and messaging. So that's where your logo is coming. Illustrations and graphics are more or less the same thing. Illustrations and graphics. Illustration and graphics add aesthetic value to your, to your design. They also give the viewer something to look at for a longer time than just read through text and content. As you can see this image on the right of a woman working on a Wacom in a Pokemon next to her on the same table is an illustration. This is an artistic expression in some sort of way to convey a similar message. And illustrations can go side by side with your content as well most of the time in order to give a sense of meaning to what you are trying to say as well. So as you can see those are illustrations. What are graphics? Graphics would be these micro dots in the back of my presentation that seem to fill the negative spaces. Subtly however, graphics can also be the backgrounds that you use, the frames that you use, the borders or even these lines could be graphics if they were in a different color and had more elements to them. Graphics can also be your titles within your titles when you try to create designs within your titles. We will come to an example of that later. So now let's move on to other elements. Typography. Typography covers everything from font selection to font layout. Not only does it communicate your core message, but it also communicates a lot about who you are and what you're about. That's why it's important to get it right. You've got to understand the basics of typography, but you also need to understand how to use them creatively. A huge chunk of all your audience will see your website on a mobile device sometimes, which means you need a web responsive design and responsive typography to go with it. So that is something that is fairly new, responsive typography. For now, typography is a very vast subject and we won't dwell very deeply into it. For now, I will just explain to you certain fonts and why they're used and what is the difference between them. And within that, we have the serif and the sans serif. So typography being the art of arranging letters and text in a way that makes the copy legible, clear and visually appealing to the reader. It also involves font style appearance and texture, which aims to elicit certain emotions and convey specific messages. So how does that happen by just choosing the right font? So as you can see, serif fonts have these longer tails towards their ends. Wherever a line ends, it is accentuated and these fonts take up more space and are larger and heavier to look at as compared to sans serif. So serifs are nothing but these accentuations that are made. That is what a serif is. So in this, as you can see, there are no such accentuations. That's why it is called sans serif, which is French for no serif and serif. Why are serif fonts used? Serif fonts are older, an older style of fonts, more classical and they have been around for a longer period of time. And generally, if you were to look at older brands and older companies, they would have serif fonts, but not necessarily companies as we know them today, but any older establishment. If you look at banks, newspapers, uh, anywhere where you see an establishment which has classical styling, you would see a serif font. Serif fonts accentuate establishment they accentuate trust, they add that sort of a face value to a brand name. Now let's come to that is just a basic part of serif fonts. There are many other uses and many other implications of the font, which I will not get into now. Sans serif. Sans serifs were actually developed due to a need, a need to compress fonts into space. 
So when it came to pages of text in books where you wanted to compress your text so that you can fill in more lines into a single page and have a, you know, thinner book. So SAS serif fonts were developed. Their space requirements were lesser than serif fonts. And due to the spacing requirement, they became general paragraph. They are used for paragraph texts. This in particular is Helvetica, which came about as a SAS serif font, but also became a very popular web font, basically due to the same reason. They take less space and you can convey more of your message in a smaller space. That's why SAS serifs came about. SAS serifs add more dynamism to your design. They seem to be a font of a newer generation. They are versatile in their use. You can space them. You can uh, make paragraphs out of them. And they look good in presentations as well. They, they give a sense of digitalization of, you know, the future. Now, the final element that we're going to focus on today is color theory. Color is so much more than the rainbow assortment of hues in a bag. Color is influence, it's power. Color drives engagement. The colors you choose for your designs are crucial not only to your overall aesthetic, but how well your designs connect with your audience, which ultimately drives results. If you want to use color to your advantage, you need to understand how each color affects your audience and how they have a deeper me meaning behind them and how best to use color to your advantage. Different colors drive different results. When you're choosing colors for your brand, your color palette, you need to be sure the colors you choose are going to drive the results you want. For that, let me show you how we use a color wheel. So this is the color section of Adobe. And this is a pretty useful tool that I came across that has many different uses. However, today we'll focus on a few. It's a very useful tool when it comes to choosing colors for your design. So just to give you a brief idea, on how you can use it, I will explain what a color wheel is. A color wheel is an abstract illustrative organization of color hues around a circle, which show the relationships between primary colors, secondary colors and tertiary colors. A color wheel is used by artists to organize colors based on the relationship between color values. The basis of the color wheel are the three primary colors spaced evenly apart. Directly between each primary color is the secondary color created by combining them. Primary colors are red, blue and green. Secondary colors are yellow, magenta and cyan. A tertiary color, intermediate color is a color made by mixing full saturation of one primary color with half saturation of another primary color. So for example, azure, violet, rose and orange. So now that you have a brief idea of what a color wheel is, it is basically just that. Now let's talk about analogous harmony. These are, these are basically the different concepts of color harmony that exist based on the color wheel and based on how colors are spaced according to each other. So analogous is groups of color are three colors that are next to each other on the color wheel and a tertiary. Red, orange and red, orange are examples. The term analogous refers to having analog or corresponding to something in particular. An analogous color scheme creates a rich monochromatic look. So for example, if I were to select my first color as a blue. So let's just change the values in the box itself. This seems like a perfect analogous harmony. So now if I were to just change this towards blue, are you seeing how the colors are spreading across? So then you get all your analogously harmonized colors according to your first color. If I were to choose a lighter blue, if I were to choose a shade of green, and so on. Now, briefly I'd explain to you what complementary colors are. Complementary colors are colors which are found on the opposite sides of the color wheel. What does that mean? It means they create extreme contrast. So for example, if I were to choose a blue over here, it would be quite evident that I would get a yellow on the other side. The darker the blue, the brighter the yellow or the lighter the blue, the darker the yellow. So let me just twist this around and now you can see. So these are complementary colors on opposite sides of the scale. Red and green, blue and yellow. We would not be spending too much time in the other kinds of color harmony, but you are free to go through it and use this tool to your advantage as in when you like.
However, triads are something that I can explain briefly. Basically, a color harmony that is formed by equidistant colors on the color wheel. So there is a sort of equilateral triangle between three colors that is formed. They are to be equidistant and such are the triads that are formed. Now, there are many further reasons that explain why certain colors go with each other. It does not solely depend on their placement on the color wheel. Rather, the color wheel is just a tool to understand the spectrum of light and how each color harmonizes with each other. So, we, I will not further dwell on the color wheel as of now. And instead, we can move on to our next subject, uh, which is a graphic designing tool, which is very popular, which is known as Photoshop. And as you can see, we are on the Adobe site. So, Adobe is basically where you can find Photoshop as well and download it. Here, Photoshop. And so, you can act, use a free trial for now, and otherwise, you can buy the full version. A free trial comes for 30 days, and uh, you can start the trial at any time you like and, and choose your plan going forward as well. So, as for now, I have already downloaded Photoshop and I have a functioning version. You guys can also download it and then and then you can just simply launch it as any other app. So now we shall move on to a more hands-on approach and uh, I will show you the basics of Photoshop and how one can use it. I already have Photoshop downloaded. So I shall just open the interface. As you can see, uh, there is already one project open, which is untitled one. But uh, for the sake of all the users, I will be opening a new project. And uh, there are different different sizes for the projects that have already been saved as default. So it depends if you want to edit a photograph. Uh, these sizes will be in inches, 3 into 2, 6 into 4, 7 into 5, and 300 ppi, which is standard uh, depth for printing, which is your resolution pixels per inch, it's also DPI. Anything above uh, 70 DPI is generally good for print, but if you want nice, glossy, rich photographs, 300 DPI is far better. Now, print, as you can see, you have your letterheads, your legal letterheads, and then your A4, A3, A2, and all your other paper sizes, as you can see. These are in MM, as one would have it even in a traditional drawing book or inches for that matter. Then you have your art and illustration, which can be almost anything. Your posters, 18 into 24, then you have 22 into 24 inches, 22 into 36. You'll have your variations and uh, postcard. And you also have your digital art, which is your 1920 by 1080 and your 2080 by 720, which is your vertical phone screen. Then uh, you have some templates for the same in case you want free chalkboard mock-up or textures or you know a sketch sketchbook etc etc and these are all from the adobe stock website you can find more templates there i will not show you how to use templates today but rather just explain the entire interface and how to just create a simple project so here is your web template it will open a blank screen the size of most common web pages which is 1366 768 and then you have your larger web pages which are full screen 1920 by 1080 etc etc macbook has a different resolution altogether so does the imac then you have your typical mobile phone screens your ipad screen and your ios mic icons leg legacy ipad and other apple screens now a very common size to work on is generally the 1920 by 1080, which is your screen size, full screen size. And uh, these generally translate into your thumbnails on YouTube and other kinds of graphical elements that you would be making or the vertical phone for that, or sorry, repeat, or uh, your phone turned into widescreen mode, which is uh, horizontal. So now for easy understanding, we'll stick to 1920 by 1080. And uh, 72 dpi is uh, actually a good resolution for web viewing and not printing. That's why it's 72, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, yeah, it's keep it in RGB color mode, 
there are various other color modes rgb and cmyk being the most popular cmyk then again used in printing bitmap used in web uh, actually web when you're making very low bit graphics but rgb is generally where you want to be there are more advanced options which i will not get into for now and we will keep it as a you can also do a vertical orientation or horizontal orientation for now i will not use artboards but i will just uh, rename my project text and let's see what it does and here you go you have your 1920 by 1080 these are your guidelines which are there in the corners i sometimes put one guide in the middle as well you can just let it snap and it snaps into the middle and similarly for this one as well at some point it snaps and then you know that that is your in that is the center of your canvas you can just drag them from here that's it just click and drag these are your guides basically your grids and you can also switch on grids as well i will show that to you in a bit for now uh, yeah, let's switch on grids so if you want to switch on and off anything which has to do with your view you can go into view and if I want, I can clear all these guides as well. I've cleared all the guides. And I can also make a new guide layout, which is my 12 column, 24 columns, or just an eight column default. There, there are lots of kinds of guides you can make. For now, we'll just clear all existing guides and we'll just uh, switch them off as well. I just like to generally have one guide in the center just to know where the center of my frame is then here are your windows so this is basically how you can also arrange your workspace accordingly suppose supposingly if you wanted to do photographic editing you would choose the photography workspace if you were to create a graphic and web that's what we're doing now otherwise the essentials is also quite all right so now that we have that in place so let me show you the common tools this is the move tool uh, so that i shall actually let me create one element first and then according to that element i shall show you all other tools so for now let me just create a plain and simple text that is the text tool your cursor changes to the text tool and then you can type so now you cannot see what I am typing as the color is not right. So I control A as any text uh, file or even in a document, I've selected all. And over here, I can just change the color to black and it has been made. So suppose I want to change it to any color, I can just select all a different color and I can select it and it's done. Now let's put it in the center as this is our main element. Let me just write uh, hello for now. Okay. So what we can do now is, uh, as you can see, that was my text tool. This is my move tool. With the help of this tool, I can move my text up and down with my arrow keys and left and right back in the center. And if I keep a uh, shift pressed while moving with my arrow keys, I can move it much. 10 spaces at a time, as you can see. Back to the center. Control and uh, the plus key will let you zoom in. Control and the minus key will help you zoom out. This is effective when you want to align everything. As you can see, my yellow is not completely center aligned, so I will move it with my arrow keys, and now it is in the center. Alignment is very important. Again, with the touch on T, I've selected. Uh, that's the. If you just hover your mouse on the tool, it shall tell you in those small brackets key how to sel quick select that tool. So suppose right now this is my move key that I've selected. As you can see, the four arrows are showing up next to my cursor, and if I press T, it changes into the text tool, and I can select my form. Now that I've selected my font, I want to edit my font. This small A icon over here belongs to my characters. From where I can change the size of my font, color, spacing, leading, and kerning. And of course, other values, uh, baseline, 
I can make it capital, lower caps, italics, hard caps, and so forth. For now, I can change my font from here, whichever font I would like. Bottom, area, rounded, bar house, and all other fonts. But for now, I just want to increase the size, so I will go up to 72, which is slightly larger than what I had earlier. Maybe even more, I can go to 121, and that's a fairly sizable mark. Now, as you can see, I've selected my move tool again, because uh, my fonts have obviously moved from the center, and I'd like to place them back. Now, there is another way. When your element is selected, you can just go to your align bar on top. These are your align options. And you can select align to canvas and then all your options are not thanked out anymore and this takes it to the center and this takes it to the vertical center now if i want to change my color as you can see i can change my color to whatever i want i can put the rgb values if i want it completely blue i'll say blue 255 blue and Zero red, it's completely blue now. You can also change your, the size of your text from the text size up top by selecting your text with the text key and then select all. As you can see, you can even size it down. You have your font options as well bold, ugly, oblique, bold, oblique, let's leave it at bold, oblique for now. And again, that is me zooming in, control and plus, control and minus. So now let's see our other tools. Other rectangular marquee. With this, you can select things and copy them. If I were to, like, depending on what's on my layer, I can choose things with the rectangular marquee and have them repeat. So let me show you that again. So you select the layer. Actually, I have not explained what the layers are, but the layers are basically your background. And uh, as in when you create other elements, they come onto newer layers. So when I created my first text, it was on one layer. If I were to say hello again, it's on another layer. And accordingly, when I select my layers, I have the freedom to edit only those layers. And what I do to one layer will not happen to the other. I'll give you an example of that shortly. So let's say I were to be on this layer, which is the larger hello, and I were to choose my rectangular marquee tool on this layer and say, I've chosen the, by a simple drag and snap, and now control C, control V, and I've pasted another hello in another layer. But this hello, because it has been copy pasted, is actually an image and not a font. So it cannot be edited with the text key. Rather, if you were to use the text key over this, you would create another text layer. The layers can be switched on and off, and they would disappear from your canvas if all were switched off. And if your canvas was switched off, you would get this gray and white grid, which means a complete transparent value. Now, uh, we shall, uh, Delete the image based hello and also the other hello which I used to explain the layers. And now I will show you the next tool. This is the lasso tool. Actually, cut. The next tool that I would like to explain is the, obviously the paint bucket. You can use it on an empty layer. And as the color that is selected, I can paint the entire layer with it. So now I've changed the background color with the paint color. I can also use the, can I use the paint bucket on a text layer? It will have to be rasterized. So if I rasterize the type, it becomes an image. That's what rasterization is. It is no longer a test. text, now it is a vector image. And now I can use the paint bucket on each element separate. As you can see, I have colored the background and the text in the same color. Now, if I go to the background, and I'm, as you can see, I'm switching between white and red over here. And now I've made my paint bucket white. I've selected my background, which is red. And since my font is also red, I cannot see anything. Now I will switch it back. 
white and now my text is red and my background is white the eraser tool is another simple tool i can erase in so many layer however as you can see there is a it is not a complete the hard eraser and let me change the type and then i can erase more suppose you are not happy with what you have just done photoshop lets you redo you can go to edit and undo eraser undo eraser undo a paint bucket and you can also do the shortcut keys which are written right there so if i were to redo shift control z shift control z and i'm back to my house this is the crop tool you can crop certain elements and bring them into focus and i just crop the entire control z and back to my house the eyedropper basically lets you select the color and once you've selected the color and you have your rgb values you can uh, okay so a simple exercise with the eyedropper so we shall go back to adobe color to color wheel and let's try and color the background in a complementary color to our font so we've chosen the color with the eyedropper as you can see it's no longer if i were to click on white it would go white in the corner over here and if i were to click on red it would go red and depending on any color in my frame i can select it so for now i will select red and i will see what red this is this is 255 red and uh, I will take that RGB value to 55 red, or I, I could even use the hashtag of the num of the color. And I will go here. And okay, here is it's basically you need the hashtag of the number. So the hashtags are uh, basically hashtags which uh, define the color that you've selected. And as you can see, FF0000 is a complete red, and the analogous. Harmony would be all of these colors, but I want a complementary color. So I go to complementary colors, add my color hashtag here. I've got a complete red and a complete, not exactly a complete green, but shade of green. So let me just take that and let me put that over here into the hashtag in Photoshop. And I've got that green right here now in my color picker. Then I select my paint bucket and I color the background and this little white spot here by clicking on it and I've got a complementary background or complementary foreground. Another tool that we can look at is the magic wand or the quick selection tool for that matter. It is based on the color. It selects, we'll actually look at the magic wand tool. The magic wand tool uh, for that reason I'm going actually repeat. So now let's look at the magic wand tool. The magic wand tool works on a single layer when there are two colors present in it. So let me merge. Actually, let me. Okay, now my colors are on a single layer. So the magic wand tool will only select the color that you wish to select. So like that. Right now I clicked on green and it selected green completely. And I can just press delete. Sorry, my layers are not selected. So now that my layer is selected and I've clicked on the color that I want to select within my layer, I can just click delete and it deletes everything that was green. I should show this to you one more time. Uh, suppose I were to click the paint bucket and color my background green. I will select the corresponding layer, choose my magic wand, choose the color that I wish to remove from the frame and backspace. Control D to remove the selection. So these are some fairly simple tools to use in Photoshop and uh, we'll mo move forward with another example. So now we will start with a fairly simple example in which I'm going to try and make a small thumbnail of the series Game of Thrones and uh, out of two simple images that I've downloaded from the internet. So just to give you an idea I put them here and what we are basically going to do is combine two images, one title and one image from the movie itself in Photoshop. So if you want to import a image into Photoshop, there are two ways about way of going about it. One, you can go into the import tab and then select your files, or you can even open them directly and they would open. Uh, but uh, the simplest way is to just go to your image file in your uh, computer and drag and drop. 
and now that it is here you can uh, extend it so that it fits your frame so that you do not have any awkward empty spaces on the edges and it should snap right there now that we have this in place our background is in place now we will try and uh, add the other image which is a game of thrones title uh, generally these come in uh, titles come in two different versions as you can see over here we can go into the properties and we can see it is a png file png files generally do not have any background associated with them so you might see something of a white square but generally the white square would be transparency but as you can see i dragged and dropped it into photoshop and because it is a png there is no background i can make it as big as i like or as uh, small as i like by basically uh, clicking and then keeping it pressed in the corner and going up to whatever size as you can see this is my uh, height and uh, weight lock so my aspect ratio remains the same while enlarging and downsizing so now we need to find a nice uh, place to put this uh, as you can see it's not really fitting in the corners there is a nice empty space over here where it could fit but then again according to the other principles uh, we should actually place text on the left as that is the movement of the eye from the right to the left from the left to the right sorry and if you want to emphasize on the title it should be somewhere on the top left of the frame but as you can see all the character spaces are getting covered so what should we do next we can move the characters a little to the right but then how do we manage to create an empty space for our title this would make us change everything there's still not enough space for the title so we will just control c control c go back to our initial arrangement now how do we solve this problem if our title was not in a rectangular form but rather all the words were in a line would that solve our problem let's see so this is simple as i have already taught you how to use the cutting tool you will zoom into our frame control plus control plus and uh, we will use our selection marquee tool a rectangle marquee and we will just select game off carefully we do not want to get anything of the bottom design and we do not want to cut out anything of the top design so now control x control c control b and we have created another line yes now we would obviously have to remove game off from this or what we could do is instead of uh, trying to cut that out we could just take the bottom part with our marquee tool again now that we've got thrones as well we shall place it in front of game off and we will remove our initial layer now we want to ensure that it is all in the same way now if you look at the layers you will notice that there is this lock so now that i am fine with where my background is i shall leave it there and i shall lock the layer now that the layer is locked no matter how many times i click on it it will not get selected i cannot move it i can only move what i wish to move which is, which are the title elements with them closer with our arrow keys and now as you can see there is a little edge of the g that has appeared in thrones uh, it's nothing to worry about you can just select your layers select the right layer and yes that's layer two you can rename your layers by double clicking on them i will rename this thrones and i will rename this game now how do i clean my thrones where i select it i take my eraser and i carefully actually I will not use the eraser for this i will take the rectangular marquee tool again and i will carefully select just that and x space gone is it yes there's still a line over there we can zoom in further and yeah it's pretty clean and we zoom out 
and we have a nice straight title that does not take that much space. Is it aligned with the other? How do we find out? We center align both of them that, as well as game off, and we center align them to the center as well. Yeah, align the canvas. I showed this to you earlier. Select layer and select the alignment option. And now uh, we select game off. Our move tool is selected. And you can just press shift and the arrow keys and it moves on one side, keeping the center. And then we can select thrones and do the same, move it to the other side. Now we know that we are both centrally aligned and in the same line and of the same size. By the notion of the eye, we'll have to tell whether the orb is in the center or not. As of now, there's no other way of doing that. We select both of them and now our move key works on both of them together. Now we can go either to the bottom and see how this looks. Center align it. And uh, does that look like a good enough poster? Okay, we can center align it again as we have a blitz shift and the arrow key. Here is better. The gold contrasts with the black of her dress. And we have added two elements in the same frame. And one more thing we can do is you can select two layers, and you can right click, and you can merge them, and they become one layer. This can be done with all kinds of graphic elements, making it seems even bigger. And uh, with the move to move to the center again. Now, uh, what is it that we could do to bring the title out even more? We could uh, probably darken the layer at the back. How do we do that? We can uh, go to image, go to adjustments, brightness and contrast. We can reduce the brightness. So that our title stands out even more. Increase the contrast. And there you have it. Just take this up a bit. Seems like it's too low in the frame. And yes. There are many more effects that we could do. And there are many more ways that we could treat this frame as well. But for now, I was just going to keep it simple. I've shown you some uses of the rectangular marquee tool. There are many other tools which can be used in many other ways, especially within image modes and adjustments. There are many things we can do to the background, many filters, many effects to play around with. But for now, we will just keep it to these. Increase a little vibrance in the background. Make the image seem a little more live, saturate it further. And maybe even we can click on our title as it's a rasterized image. We can add effects to it. It's not a text. We can increase the brightness on this. Let's see what how this looks. It's brighter. More contrast. Repeat. I think that's a good enough job for today. And uh, the work as a thumbnail. You would obviously require more information if we were to actually use this for a purpose of value. But as of now, we do not have such information. So we will stick with this. This in turn wraps up the introduction to graphic design video. Thank you for your patience of listening and watching. Now that the image is created and uh, you wish to create a JPEG out of it, all you have to do is click on File, Export. You have various options for export. You could also just save as. That's the simpler thing one can do. Uh, you can go into whichever folder you want and select uh, whatever name you want, G O P S. And uh, there are various formats in which you can save: JPEG, PCX, RAW, PDF, which you know be open by Adobe, PSD, which is a Photoshop document file, etc., etc. I stick to a standard JPEG for now and you can save it and you can choose your quality as well.
and you can save it as a large quality file that's 1.4 mb which is not very large and uh, you can also save your project file as a psd as a rule of thumb you should always do that and that can also have the same name geoks will not overwrite the jpeg as the file extensions are separate it is safe and now that you close it you can execute the file from save location as well geotest open it whenever you like whenever you need to make changes to the file and this is the jpeg file which will open as in windows as well you can share it on social media you can edit it in photoshop again and uh, that's about it now a jpeg I've created an image. I want to introduce you to Great Learning Academy, a free initiative by Great Learning, where you can access over 200 plus courses with 1000 plus hours of free content on trending high demand domains absolutely free. Register now to complete the course and get your free certificate of completion. Check out the link in the description of the video below. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, I want to request you to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notifications bell so that you don't miss out on any new updates or video releases from Great Learning. If you enjoy this video, show us some love and like this video. Knowledge increases by sharing, so make sure you are sharing this video with your friends and colleagues as well. Make sure to comment on the video any queries or suggestions and I will respond to your comments.